I'm Dr. Richard Geyer from the Center for Disc Replacement at TBI. Hi, I'm Dr. Jessica Shellock, also from the Center for Disc Replacement at TBI. Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Blumenthal, also from the Center for Disc Replacement at TBI. And we're here to give some updates uh, over the past year on art artif artificial disc surgery, arthroplasty. Um, first question I want to ask, and, and this is kind of basic and, and it's been asked already at this meeting, is the fixation that some surgeons have of with cervical disc replacement of, of just treating the soft disc herniations, which we started doing 20 years ago. Talk about, with 20 years of experience, how uh, you've expanded your indications uh, for disc replacement in the neck. So I don't quite have 20 years of experience, but going on 13, I will say that even in my practice from the first few years out to now, I feel as though my personal indications have expanded. Um, I think that you know, I've learned from experience that arthroplasty can be used on patients that do have spondylotic disease, not just the classic soft disc. Um, certainly there are limits to what we can tolerate, but I think that we are consistently pushing the envelope on some of those limits and seeing consistently good results. So um, I'm no longer scared away from some mild to moderate spondylosis if I feel that the level is still amenable to um, restoring motion and um, you know, I will basically look for a reason not to put arthroplasty as my first choice. Yeah, and I think it really goes back to a basic philosophy. Originally, we were all geared to do fusions, and now that we have motion preservation or the disc replacement, it's still a fixation among most surgeons to live by the FDA indications. And partly that's because of what the insurance companies state and will approve. But um, what we found, it's much like artificial hip replacement. You know, no one today would ever have a fusion of their hip joint. They would have an artificial disc. So our philosophy is now to look for reasons why we cannot do an artificial disc. And as you stated, Jessica, that it would be the patient that has a lot of bony abnormalities. But we've been doing them on all age patients beyond the uh, FDA recommendations and with very, very good results. You have to be very selective as we are. And, um, you know, uh, we've been very, very surprised and very happy with the results. Yeah, and obviously I agree. And, and if I remember correctly, a couple of years ago, we presented a paper here uh, looking at the percent of patients that came to us for cervical disc replacement and which ones were contraindicated. We still do fusions where appropriate. And I believe it was about 80-20 uh, in favor of disc replacement. And, and that's with the, the newer indications that we feel more comfortable with, which is multi-level, inclusions in hybrids, and the older patients that weren't really included in the original FDA studies. And I think the good news is that patients are now asking for disc replacement. When they're offered a two-level fusion, and even more than a two-level fusion, they will often come to us for a second opinion, and we'll give them a, a decision whether or not they're a candidate for disc replacement, and in many cases, they are. So another kind of emerging topic over the last year is with eight different cervical discs on the market, three of which with multi-level uh, indications, it's, is disc selection, particularly the mechanics of the disc and the materials. So I guess my question is, number one, how should novice surgeons approach that decision making? And then as experienced surgeons, how do you, how do you make your decisions on which disc on which patient? So, great question, and I think that um, there's a lot of factors to consider. For me, I really um, try to assess patient's anatomy, um, how many levels I'm gonna be operating on, um, you know, if I feel that there are um, any radiographic indicators suggesting that at baseline the patient might have some excess mobility, um, then that factors into perhaps choosing a device that has a little bit more constraint. Um, the profile of the device, how that's going to match up with the end plates, the, the size of the device. Um, you know, we have options now that include going down to a four millimeter height um, in multi-level reconstructions when the spaces are very collapsed. It's nice to have that option to feel like you are not overstretching multiple spaces. Um, and then as far as the materials, I think that with the 
standard, more classic materials, we've always battled the potential issues with post-operative imaging um, if we wanted to evaluate the cord. And now we, with the simplified disc, we now do have an option to be able to very easily um, image the post-op spine with um, essentially no artifact. And that opens the door to situations where there may be some cord signal change or things that we know we might want to follow that um, I, I feel comfortable knowing that even with an arthroplasty, I won't have to worry about um, you know detrimental post-op imaging or something that I can't make sense of. Yeah, I, I think that what we've seen, and with the most recent approval of the simplified disc, we've seen the slow the slow progression to uh, developing a more ideal disc, meaning that one is anatomic. Uh, you referred to the no, the lower height, and in the simplified study, which is a plastic on a ceramic uh, core, it comes in the four millimeters. And most patients, that is 50% or more in the study, require just a four millimeter. And then the imaging. So that has all the the best of all worlds now there'll be others we're also learning about other materials that may not be so good just like with the total hip literature they struggle with osteolysis early on because of the metal on the polyethylene uh, cup and they have made change that so that has become less and now 80 percent of total hips are ceramic on polyethylene so we're also seeing change in certain discs where we're seeing a higher rate of osteolysis compared to other discs yeah, and I, and I think the kind of the two topics that have emerged over the last year is hypermobility, like you said, um, picking the correct mechanics of the disc to match the patient, and material wear, uh, and the potential complication of osteolysis. And that you know seems to be a, a product of, of uh, elastomeric discs. So I'll ask you both, elastomeric discs, the, the squishy disc, hyperhope. I'd like to think that there is hope. I'm not sure that that's imminently around the corner, um, but you know, I think that at this point, we're just not maybe quite there with the technology for the right materials for that. I like the idea. I think that it makes some sense with something that mimics the characteristics of a native disc. Um, having said that, we look at the data from the disks that we have now, and the data is great. So, you know, is that going to somehow change that? I, I don't know. All right, I think it's hype. And I was a first proponent of the viscoelastic disk. I thought this was going to be the cat's meow. It was going to be the, the latest and greatest. But what we're finding out that the uh, poly on metal or poly on Basically, I'm, I'm really referring to the total hips because we have more experience with them. We have 22 and a half years. And we are just not seeing the problems with them as we are with the viscoelastic disc. So I just think that the materials that we have today are just not suited for either the cervical or the lumbar spine. We've seen a number of failures that come in from Europe. And granted, we don't know what the denominator is. So it's sort of skewed data, except that I think that it's not the, in the present form, it is not an ideal material. The other thing, the public gets fixated on the fact that they think when you walk around, your disc bounce up and down. They don't. Basically, you start with a certain amount of fluid in your disc. As time goes on, it compresses down. So I am no longer a big advocate of viscoelastic disc. What do you think, Scott? Uh, I, I echo what, what Rick says. Um, before we move on to lumbar, I want to I want to tease something for next year, which is uh, what we're we're going to start evaluating is our revision cervical arthroplasties and when we can revise them to another disc and when it's appropriate for a, a fusion. And hopefully, we'll have that paper done by next year. We can talk about it. Great. What's new in lumbar? Rick, you go first. Well, the, the big news is the lumbar uh, arthroplasty is now approved for two levels, and it's been like that I think for about two years, and um, the good news is that originally, uh, insurance companies rarely approved two levels. Now we're seeing more and more of them approve the two level. And the results from lumbar arthroplasty are just rock solid. We've been doing this since March of 2000, and in fact, I'm reporting on our series of 1,800 patients, and our revision rate is so low, much lower than everybody thought, and it really uh, rivals total hips and total knees. It's 0.75% once you get past the learning curve. That means we put a lumbar artificial disc in it stays there, the wear is minimal, the patients continue to do well. If you select the patients properly, multiple level patients do as well as single level. We've done as many as three, we've done four. Um, 
and you just have to select the patients really, really well. So I am high on the present artificial disc that we have. And I think that you know more and more patients are presenting, even younger patients, with multi-level symptomatic degenerative disease. And so now we have an opportunity with the FDA approval to hopefully garner you know continued um, you know support from the insurance companies to be able to provide this. Um, having said that, I'm also going to be talking about one of our papers later today on hybrids. So for the situation in which symptomatic multi-level disease um, is not amenable at every level to an arthroplasty, but it's not desirable to do multi-level fusion, um, the idea of hybrids, I, I hope that that's something that can become um, approved moving forward as well so that we have these options in our um, armamentarium to, to treat the patient with what is the best for each level that's indicated. Yeah, and, and as a corollary to what, what Jessica said, uh, we also have a paper here looking at artificial discs next to remote fusions where it's been, fusion's been done previously and the patient gets an artificial disc next to it um, as an alternative to keep extending the fusion up and up. And, the, the one comment I, that, that you made me think of that you know, I'd like to say uh, before I run out of things to talk about is it is unbelievably silly that we're seeing insurance companies approve two-level lumbar disc replacements, whereas if you live in Washington, Oregon, oh. or North Carolina, or have Aetna, you can't even get a one-level disc replacement. And, and worse, Scott, patients that have recurrent disc herniations are committed probably 90 plus percent of the spine surgeons to fusions. They are our best patients. We all have done them. It's like doing an ACDF to retrieve the disc fragment. The patients do wonderful after those operations and we still get pushback. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, recurrent disc herniation, boom, fusion, no. If they have otherwise fulfill the criteria for disc replacement, it's a much better mousetrap, particularly on, on younger patients. And one other thing that made me think about it, on Friday morning we have conferences and our fusion surgeons and our deformity surgeons are showing revision after revision after revision. We rarely have a revision case with artificial discs and we've been doing them for 22 and a half years. Rarely do we show a revision. Right. In fact, I can't remember the last time we did. About one a year is what it comes down to.